。欢迎收看今天的汉天新闻，我是张潇。首先来看美国国内消息。九月四日，报道美国五角大楼发言人乔纳森·霍夫曼表示。美国国防部部长在获得国会批准六周后，签署了将一百二十七项国内外延期军事项目的资金转移的协议。这一协议是为回应白宫的要求，将三十六亿美元的军事建设资金用于修建大约一百八十二公里长的边境墙。Norfolk, Virginia, is home to the U.S. Navy's Atlantic Fleet and the largest naval base in the world. The area's central and vital role in military operations and national security hasn't stopped the Trump administration from naming four different military projects here, whose almost 80 million dollars in funding will now be diverted to pay for the border wall. All of these projects are being lost for a wall that makes no sense, and everybody knows it. Democratic Congressman Bobby Scott has represented the district for almost three decades and says President Trump's decision is costing his constituents jobs. It means that the jobs that could have come to the area won't come to the area.、Uh, tens of millions of dollars worth of、uh, worth of construction. That's a lot of economic impact、uh, to this area that we're going to lose for a wall that is not needed. In all, 3.6 billion dollars in military funds are being taken to help pay for the wall. 127 projects, from firing ranges to aircraft hangars to childcare, both at home and abroad, whose budgets are being gutted. In Virginia, the four that are losing 77 million dollars in funding are a naval ship maintenance facility. Two hazardous materials warehouse projects and a cyber operations facility. In a place with such a historic and important military heritage, where 40 percent of the economy is related to military funding, that hurts both financially and emotionally. Our community is a fabric built、um, on military veterans and a very healthy、uh, po- military population here in the Hampton Roads region. So I think there's a general sense of disappointment. Bruce Sturck retired from the Air Force as a colonel, last serving at Langley Air Force Base, which is now being stripped of $10 million for that cyber operations and training facility. At a time when cyber attacks are one of the greatest threats to national security, along with others that will now be ignored, says Democratic Congresswoman Elaine Luria. A retired naval commander whose district is also affected. You know, I know firsthand from you know having spoken to the the commanders at the bases where this impact is going to happen that it is going to impact our mission and our security. Not just the security of the nation, but those serving it, whose priorities now may not be addressed. It's like your husband, it's your neighbor, it's your wife who's going on a deployment, and you don't want to think that you know their ship wasn't maintained properly, they didn't have the right tools that they needed to go do their job. So it hits home a lot in a community like this where everyone is so tied to the military. 飓风多利安重创巴哈马，造成三十人死亡和数千人无家可归后，今天继续朝美国北卡罗来纳州沿海逼近。当地一整夜陷入狂风暴雨，而在佛罗里达州已有六人因恶劣天气袭击丧命。现在，来自世界各地及各国际组织的救援物资已经得到筹备，然而将他们切实运送到受灾地区却困难重重。Today's North Carolina has watched Hurricane Dorian approaching and known that just a few miles could make a major difference. We are seeing that play out right now. Wilmington, North Carolina, right here, did not have landfall as they had feared they might. Now the storm has passed. People are out moving their boats from safe harbor back to regular spaces. The sky is blue, but about 145 miles away is where Dorian actually did make landfall. We are hearing from state representatives that they are hearing that potentially hundreds. Of people could be trapped on barrier islands. Dorian is very much still on the move. Fierce winds, torrential rain, and destructive tornadoes. I just heard this roar, and you, I couldn't see the funnel, but I just saw like this big wall of water. Residents of the Carolinas bearing Dorian's wrath over the past 24 hours as the hurricane just scrapes along the coast. It was a long night for many North Carolinians along our coast this morning. Hurricane Dorian officially made landfall near Hatteras and continues to batter the Outer Banks and east, northeastern North Carolina with heavy wind and rain. Many in the storm's path waking this morning to devastated homes and businesses after tornadoes sprung up Thursday. Debris flying everywhere. 
I've never seen anything like this. Tens of thousands are without electricity as power lines are down throughout the region. We currently have more than 215,000 power outages and crews are working hard to restore power to those customers and we should see those numbers drop throughout the day. Fortunately, the storm is weakening and moving out to sea, allowing residents in the region to breathe a little easier. We hope this is our last storm of the year. We hope people will come down and visit us after the hurricane, and, and we'll be open for business as soon as we can. As Dorian continues to track northeast, residents in New York will face beach closures due to riptides, while parts of Massachusetts are under a tropical storm warning where high winds are expected throughout much of the weekend. The Department of Transportation in North Carolina says that dozens of roads have been impacted by the storm covered by water. They are closed, but meanwhile, the Coast Guard's evaluating the port of Wilmington, expecting to open it, perhaps with some stipulations a little later today. In Wilmington, North Carolina, I'm Emily Schmidt. Now back to you. 飓风多利安对巴哈马群岛的侵袭给当地带来了毁灭性的灾难，让当地民众巴哈马人面临了空前的人道和发展挑战。CNN记者日前深入灾区内部拍摄到了灾后满目疮痍的景象，许多地区上万栋房屋坍塌，电线和道路遭受严重的破坏，甚至供水系统也已崩溃，民众生活异常艰难。Hurricane Dorian came here and ripped the roof clean off. But not only that, you think of the power that a storm needs to knock down entire cement walls. We don't know if anybody was here, but it's hard to imagine they could have survived because residents say the storm surge, and you can see the line just up there, got this high, almost all the way to the roof, 17 feet, they said. They've measured it. You can see the water stains all the way down to the ground. The devastation everywhere you look. And the town goes all the way back to the water. There are some 300 homes here. Every home is either damaged or destroyed. You can see where the wind smashed into the sign, but somehow didn't tear it off. These are slabs of concrete, and they've been thrown around like they were nothing, like they weighed nothing. This is the High Rock prison. There's only one jail cell, and it's not guarding anybody now. We don't know if anybody was here when the storm came behind bars. They certainly didn't stick around. There's nothing left in this town, and the people say they've yet to receive any help from the government. Like so many Bahamians, they are waiting for that assistance to come. Patrick Ottman, CNN, the town of High Rock on Grand Bahama Island. Zimbabwe总统母南加古瓦今天通过推特公布了前总统罗伯特·穆加贝逝世的消息。中年九十五岁。穆加贝此前身体状况不佳。今年四月以来一直在新加坡住院接受治疗。自从1980年津巴布韦独立以来,穆加贝五次连任总统,执政37年,曾是国家解放的英雄,也被许多舆论认为是历史不可磨灭的独裁者。After 37 years in power, demanding nothing less than absolute loyalty, Robert Mugabe's reign was never going to end at the ballot box. But few could have imagined those two weeks in November 2017 when his military moved against him and his people took to the streets. So what did those crowds mean to former President Mugabe? What did he say? You saw that they spoke. You saw that they spoke. Did it break him? It moved him. It moved him in this sense that he realized they are speaking to say it is, this is enough. In negotiations, the generals would salute the man they were looking to overthrow. Still, the coup and his resignation was a humiliating exit for Mugabe, whose very name came to define Zimbabwe. This is a man who had so much to offer, 
to Zimbabweans. But he didn't. He focused on himself. What a tragedy. The death of Robert Mugabe breaks my heart within the context of the millions of lives that he destroyed. The million, millions of lives that he wrecked. Robert Mugabe's legacy was built by violence and oppression. And an economic collapse so bad, money became worthless and millions fled. For many, he left behind a shell of a country. I, Robert Gabriel Mugabe, do swear... So it's easy to forget that at first he was likened to Nelson Mandela. Mugabe preached reconciliation after a brutal liberation struggle that he helped lead. Repaired bonds with former colonial master Britain, he was even knighted. The historical links between the United Kingdom and Zimbabwe, which date from far back in history, have grown from strength to strength over the years. A young Zimbabwe became the envy of the continent. Mugabe, trained as a teacher, presided over an education revolution and a thriving agricultural powerhouse. Robert Mugabe was my hero. And I looked up to Robert Mugabe's eloquence, uh, Robert Mugabe's uh, uh, confidence in postulating amazing positions. And I, I decided that this is the man that impressed me. But Mugabe liked to say he had a degree in violence. And from the start, he squashed dissent. How, how, how? Yes, I saw people being killed. I saw them killed. And you could not say a word. Alice Mwali relives her trauma every day. Her back was broken by the North Korean-trained 5th Brigade as they swept through Matibililand in 1983. The operation was called Gukura Hundi in Shona, or the rains that wash away the chaff. Meant to crush Mugabe's rivals, civilians were targeted, victims chosen along ethnic lines. When Mugabe's power was again threatened, this time at the ballot, he sanctioned violent attacks, seizing white-owned farms by so-called war veterans, strengthening his hand. And he crushed a rising opposition, using his hold on state security. But the violence shocked the world. Mugabe was abandoned by the West and its aid, and the country never fully recovered. They want to come to us and dictate to us what we must do. That shall never be. Not in Zimbabwe. Never, never. Whatever the cost. Robert Mugabe was not an idiot in the country. He worked hard for this country. Mistakes were done, but he's a man who cared. But ultimately, of course, the president is, in the end, wholly responsible for whatever action. Actions throughout a long rule and rapid demise that many critics say were driven by Mugabe's number one priority, himself. Indo-Yue-Chan-2号探月任务的关键时刻即将到来。在经历多天绕月飞行之后,着陆器已经与轨道飞行器脱离。计划于7日在月球表面实现软着陆。印度时报等多家媒体评论称,如果能够按照计划完成月面软着陆,印度将加入此前只有美国、前苏联、中国三国的全球月面软着陆精英俱乐部。Only three countries, the US, the former Soviet Union and China, have managed to land a spacecraft on the moon. Lift up, normal. And now India is hoping to do just that with this probe, called Chandrayaan-2, it's due to land on the lunar surface. For the first time, a craft will make a soft landing close to the moon's southern pole. This mission sets the stage for something much bigger, putting Indian astronauts in space by 2022. For India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi, it's about projecting national power. We will send a manned mission into space and we will do it with our own astronauts. India has already made a mark on the final frontier. In 2017, it launched more than 100 satellites in one mission. And in 2014, it made global headlines by sending a satellite into orbit around Mars, all for just $74 million, staggeringly cheap for a space mission. But questions remain about India's ambitions. Analysts say there is a huge gulf between the country's goals 
and what it can realistically achieve, at least for now. One clear indicator to see whether these are feasible and how, how quickly these are feasible is the budget allocation. And if, when you look at the budget allocation for space in the last few years, uh, there have been talk about increasing the space budget, but there has been a very, very marginal increase. It's going to be a while before we see these things materializing. Setting big goals does, however, send a signal that India has arrived. Some of these things are merely to show that we have ambitions, we are going to be a big player, we are a big power, we do have ambition. And that's what it comes down to. 50 years on from the Apollo 11 moon landings, India wants the world to know that it is making its own giant leaps. Ram Ram Gopal, CNN.